if I had played, you see, defense. Yes. Defense. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. And it played it did the animation and everything. It looked cool. Awesome. Let's get started then. So, uh, Chad, basically, just to bring you up to speed, since I'm going to ask you to help me out here, and sure. um, uh, you know, this is a variation. This is a really high level summary of a of a presentation that Chad and I have given to various people uh, over the years. And, but I've super simplified this because I just want to talk about some high level things. And the first is just this basic concept of defense and depth and what that means. And Chad, you're better at talking about this than I am, but just the concept of defense and depth in cars and how that relates to security. Do you mind yeah. about that? We're all, yeah, we're all learning. So, I mean, uh, and there's always going to be hopefully a better analogy. This is just one that seems to work really well with a lot of diverse audiences, young and old and different kinds of people. And because um, we all ride in cars, right? And, and a lot of the parts of the world, wherever we might be, um, odds are pretty good. We have ridden or driven a car. And there's a lot of things that are going on in a car, kind of the hidden machinery, I call it, of cars uh, that, that are working all together in this kind of, you know, harmony to minimize preventable risks, you know, accidents that could be prevented that might hurt us. Um, and cars are pretty old. They've been around, you know, for a pretty long time. Like they went mainstream in, in the U.S. at least um, in the 30s. Um, and now, you know, we're almost, you know, 100 years of being around cars um, and talking about cars. And th these things have evolved. These things didn't all exist, like crumple zones, things like crumple zones, side impact bars, airbags, sensors, passenger safety cells. Um, you know, these things didn't exist when cars came out, right? Cars were really very basic and very dangerous, <laughs> very dangerous things to ride in at speed. Um, and this is a great analogy because when we walk out to cars now, we don't think about any of this stuff, right? When we're hustling out to our car to get to that, you know, I mean, remember when we used to go to meetings, um, you know, but <laughs> yeah. the hustle out to our cars, we didn't think about any of this stuff, right? We just knew it was there. We trusted it. Uh, and we still do. We trust it and we get in the car and we drive. And, and this is a great analogy for you know, a resilience practice or a security practice for any business because there are things just like this that all need to be in place. You know, it's like, do we need safety belts? Hmm. Hopefully we won't ever need them when we're in our car, right? But we have them because if we need them and we don't have them, right. then we're talking about a very different outcome. Yeah, I've got uh, two teenage drivers and I think Michelle knows what I'm talking about because she also has two teenage drivers. And, uh, you know, our car is, is within the past couple of years, new car. And it's got so many bells and whistles and safety features in it, uh, like lane detection. If you veer off the lane, it'll alert you. Um, if you if on cruise control, if you get too close to a car, it will prevent you from hitting that car. Uh, and then it's got these little lights that go off if someone's in your blind spot. It's got, and it's great. I love it. But I, I also fear that my kids who have only driven in this modern car, if they ever have to get in a car from even five years ago, mm, that doesn't that's have half of this stuff, yeah. they're going to already have built a reliance on this and they don't really know like everything they need to know to drive. Mm -hmm. So I would equate today, a lot of people are driving their business with those, not just five-year-old cars, but maybe 10 or 20 year old cars mm -hmm. and they kind of need the new car with the new defense and depth. Right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, if they care, you know, about avoiding these kinds of incidents, I mean, I think the average incident, uh, the last research that I was digging into last year at the end of the year, I guess early 2020, um, you know, the average incident for a small medium size business um, approaches two million dollars right by the time all the legal and on and that's on average right so there's highs and lows to that um, but an average of being like I think it was like 2.1 million dollars and and some of the, the research that that I'd seen um, you know the big reports that you can find online um, that, that's a lot of money right and that doesn't also yeah. that doesn't also include things that are less quantifiable like our time our reputation 
right? I mean, those are things that are really hard to measure. Um, but in most cases, when something happens and we have to notify our clients, um, right. they're, prob they're probably not going to be our clients anymore, right? Especially if we haven't prepared for this, you know, that sort of thing. Well, we all get into our cars and, and think that's not going to be us that gets in that car accident, even though there are tons of car accidents out there. Um, and just like we all think that's not going to be us when it comes to cyber crime. And there is tons of cyber crime out there. So let's talk a little bit about what um, this little uh, summary, IT is not security. You know, I have this conversation a lot. We talk about, hey, you know, it'd be great if, if you as an organization did X, Y, or Z, defense in depth, to protect yourself, to protect your team, the jobs that you have, and to protect your clients. It's all, you know, we're all related in this. And sometimes I hear, well, aren't you, forget computers, doing that for us? And that really scares me. <laughs> yeah. Because no, there is so much that we are not doing and cannot do for you uh, without you as an organization being involved and in taking some of these steps to protect yourself. And so this is something that, uh, Chad, I know uh, we've talked about before, and it's, it's not anything we made up, but it is a common misconception that, that I, you know, people think IT is security when, in fact, it is not. IT is not security. There's, those are two separate practices, and the, you really have to have intention in both. And for years, you know, we've operated as an IT company helping our clients with technology, <clears throat> And we're trying to also help them with security, and we definitely have the capacity to do that. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand what that means. So is there anything else you want to add to that before I Yeah, it's, it's tricky because um, when this all started, all this stuff, you know, I mean, we've been in technology pretty much since the beginning or early enough. Um, you know, it was mid-90s, mid you know, for me in Seattle when I first got mm -hmm. involved and technology and then as time went on the the impression that i got even working in it and outside of it um was that it really didn't know um you know what what to do about security it, it was the kind of situation where i would interact with it like in a corporate environment for example and they would say things like um oh, you don't have admin rights right we can't give you admin rights um and what that meant was that on my work machine, whatever kind of machine it was over the years, um, I didn't have much control to install stuff on those machines, right? And, and IT just said, hey, you know, the impression I got was like, hey, IT, you got this, you got everything covered, I'm not gonna worry about anything, right? And in a way, it was kind of like, kind of like, you know, giving a kid a false sense of security when we send them off on their bikes or whatever with a helmet, mm -hmm. right? It's really, it's really easy to think that that helmet is going to make us invincible so we can ride really risky. We can, you know, risk and ride fast and go off every jump. Um, and so the impression that I got from other IT departments over the years in different, you know, industries and, and parts of the world was pretty consistent was that we'll take care of it for you. Don't you worry about it. And mm -hmm. the, prob the problem with that is a lot of those early IT cultures were they weren't intending to but i think they unintentionally transmitted this message that it is security and so in the very beginning early you know in the first 10 years of consumers using internet i think most people kind of lumped them into the same room in their mind if they did it all mm -hmm. yeah i mean we still have people contacting us clients saying hey i you know i don't have my password for whatever account could you give that to me? And they're often surprised when we say, well, no, we don't, we don't know your passcode. Like, what do you mean you don't know my passcode? Didn't, didn't you create the passcode? It's like, well, no, we, did, we didn't create the passcode. We don't store the passcode. We don't want the responsibility of knowing your passcode. Uh, we can help you reset the passcode. Sure. That's more often the, the answer. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, a lot of IT teams, you know, typically in the corporate area on the Windows side, told people for many years that we're going to protect you and they can no longer protect you without your involvement. Uh, and Apple is a little different, in, you know, good and bad. You know, we kind of lived as Apple users, especially Mac users, on the fringe of all of this and just kind of watched 
the Windows team deal with uh, security breaches and, and en encryption breaches or malware and uh, what do you call it, where, where they, they encrypt your hard drive ra ransomware right. and ask for money. Um, but now that's, that is, now that we're all web-based, that's bleeding over to all of us. It's, it's no longer enough that we're an Apple user that we are protected simply by using an Apple Macintosh. Uh, it's a lot more complex than that. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of people have on the Apple side operated as admins, so they have the ability to turn the keys over to uh, a ransomware or malware, malware attack. And, and we are seeing people do that. Um, they, they're unknowingly, unwittingly, you know, allowing people into their computer at a deeper level than maybe they should. So we've always talked about how we want to enable our clients to, to get their job done, but we also want to help them protect themselves and, and really find that balance as opposed to the old school IT, which tends to just default to lock things down. I mean, we've seen it where they lock it down so tight, client, uh, you know, designers can't even, can't, even, yeah. Yeah, can't yeah. even do their job. Yeah, there's a happy medium somewhere between yeah. usability and security. It's a really tough, you know, requires some finesse. And, and that's why we work really hard to, to uh, spend time uh, on the, 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 you know, not just the quantitative side of our clients' um, operations, but also the qualitative side. Um, it, it makes it makes a difference that we understand how people are using technology because it right. gets lost in translation. Right? It's really easy to presume, like when we walk into the room and someone says "God," right, or something. We all think we're on the same page. We're not even close to being on the same page. So it's really important that when we say things like IT and we say things like security, um, that those things we can define, you know, pretty well mm -hmm. with a, usually a pretty quick conversation, but it really is breaking down a lot of, um, you know, obstacles, a lot of uh, uh, things that we used to believe that aren't really true anymore. It's time we, we all mm -hmm. kind of rebooted our, you know, our awareness and, and knowledge. And, and it really is a big part of, being successful with all this stuff. Yeah. So related to that is the idea of um, resilience and how, you know, Chad, you introduced the term resilience to our team a couple of years ago when you joined us or even before that, when, when we started working together. And, um, you know, we, we like to talk less about security and more about resilience. How can we make you as an organization, as an individual, uh, be more resilient to these attacks, which which we cannot stop. Right? No, it's going to happen. It's only a matter of time. And I think that's the, the piece that is really hard for vendors to accept and for even us, you know, as practitioners and technology to accept that, you know, the stuff, the information, enough information to compromise anyone is out there. It's just kind of when they pull our number. How mm -hmm. prepared are we? you know, for a strategic response to that kind of thing, right? If it's an individual, right, it just happened with someone we know on our team, you know, a credit card was compromised and it happens, yeah. you know, it, it's nice when it's $2.47, right? But the, the reality is that that's happening to like 400 people at, at, at a time, right? Like at a moment, right? So um, if you scale right. that across the, the, the globe, that's a, somebody's making a lot of money off of fraud. Um, and when they target small, medium businesses, they, they get more than $2.47 because the small, medium businesses are the ones that are really dragging their feet on learning about mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, we'd like to drive this market up for criminals, make it harder for them. That's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to raise the cost for a criminal. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we recently had um, a lot of uh, activity here in Chicago, downtown Chicago, uh, in the evening with, um, um, you know, people looting. Um, and we watched uh, from our view of downtown, we could see on the street. Uh, you know, I saw a guy and I've, uh, I've, I've heard of this, but you, we could plain as day see it. He, he was just walking down the street, checking every single door handle of a car. Mm. And sure enough, he found one that was unlocked. Yeah. And just yeah. opened up. And so yeah. he dove in, he went through the whole thing, walked out with a bag and, and took off. And, uh, you know, the, they're going to typically pick the easier targets. Well, so well, it, if you don't have a lock on your door, uh, maybe you need two locks in some cases. Yeah. Uh, that's a great analogy, actually, because, um, you know, that's a security control 
that most people have come to accept, right? Like it's, it's a hassle, Mm -hmm. right? As most security is a hassle. It requires some interaction, but you know, when we lock our cars, you know, that, that technology has elevated to a place where it's almost automatic for most people, right? Um, when those first came out and they were manual, what a hassle. You could lock your keys in the car, you know, you could get to lock it. I mean, we've really come a long way to try to make security more usable. And that's, that's the goal, right? And all these conversations yeah. really just trying to move uh, everyone and ourselves included to, to, you know, methods, tactics that can support a larger strategy to minimize these kinds of preventable risks. Because if that person had had their door locked, that would have been a very different outcome, right? Right, right. So uh, the term resilience leads me to um, something we call the resilience diagnostic. And this is a bit, this is a bit of a, an ad for Forget Computers right here. Uh, but I want to make sure everyone knows, especially our primary contacts, that when it comes to defense in depth, uh, there, there's one way you can approach it, which is, well, let's just start adding some pieces of defense. And we'll get to that in a minute, what some of those pieces are. Um, but a, a, a smarter way to do it is let's do a diagnostic to understand your risk and where your risk is and how we can reduce that risk. Mm-hmm. And you know, every time we've done this, and Chad, you've done quite a few over the years, um, you know, I think you'll agree, we always surprise uh, sort of the people in charge about how their operation really operates, right? We walk in, we say, how, how, does, how does your operation operate? They tell us, and then you go out and do interviews and say, well, here's, here's how you're really operating. There's the perception, and then there's the reality. And obviously, we want to reduce the risk on the reality, not right. the perception. Yeah. We chop it up. You know, I, I always approach it, at least in my mind, it, with three different kind of spaces, three rooms in my mind, if you will, right? There's the, the, the first room you walk into, which is the perceived reality, right? How people, their mental model of how they think their business operates. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are almost written in stone in people's minds, a lot of cases. It doesn't really matter who they are, how old, what their background is, their ability level, their, you know, what technology. Um, it's always the, the kind of, you know, perception. And then the second space, this or the second room in my mind is the current state, the real current state of the business. Like what are the components, the pieces, the platforms, the tools that everyone is, or you, everyone uses to share information, right? How does information flow into that operation? You know, where does it live? Who has access to it? How does it flow out? Right. Um, and we do that. We draw those up, right? We call them data flow diagrams and, and they're very insightful, not just for this, but for lots of things. Um, um, product development, even, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing what some of cl- the clients over the years have done with these documents um, and gotten value out of them. Um, and then the third room, of course, is future state. Like ideally we take the current state and we, refine it, we improve it, we minimize its risk, therefore increasing its value, um, you know, and increasing its, you know, resilience. Right. It, and it's something that, um, it, it, and we like it, we like this kind of engagement because it gives us, even with new clients, a short-term quick return project that helps us understand if we're a good fit for each other or not, right? Because our threat models are unique, right? Our clients' mm-hmm. threat models are very different from ours. Um, every individual's threat model is different, you know, because it's, it's like a snowflake. Every, no two are the same, right? They're very, very unique. Um, and how I use technology is not the same as like how my, Michelle might use it or how Ben might use technology. And so the, that, that um, you know, interview, that qualitative investigation, right, and the analysis that we mm-hmm. do, how people use technology side um, gives us incredible insights um, into that are, you'd be surprised how simple but powerful some of these are. It could be something as simple as, you know, uh, a business leader might think that a a workflow is pretty standardized Mm -hmm. platforms and the tools are no, it's almost never the case, right? The folks are using, you know, we call it shadow it, but it's just a fancy way to say people are just working around the company, you know, tool you know, something to make things easy for themselves. Right. And so that's a big part of this conversation is, you know, we don't want to bring a tank to a knife fight. Number one, mm-hmm. right. It's silly. Um, right. But number two, we have to make sure that the re- recommendations we make fit the culture. 
and culture is my next slide. Um, but before we get to that, I want to just finalize or summarize the resilience diagnostic by saying, you know, this is a way to establish a baseline. A baseline, as you said, about where you are today, Chad, and then decide where you want to be. And uh, although it's focused on resilience um, and security, uh, we often find, you know, workflow improvements that can be made along the way. Even uh, things like like fire, you know, drills, like, like, you know, now we're not in offices so much anymore. We may never mm -hmm. be. Um, but reunification points, right? Like establishing, like if something happens where, you know, people have to be displaced in some way, like a, like a global event, like a pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, plan for those kinds of things, right? So it's not all, yeah. it's a good point, Ben, because it's not all technology. You know, a lot of it is um, just anything that can have value um, for the business to be resilient against a lot of different kinds of things that might disrupt it. Yeah, and we talk a lot about when we're doing these, you know, as an organization, Forget Computers, has a lot of technical data on our clients. We know the software and the hardware that they have at their disposal to operate on, but we don't know really at all how they use that technology. I mean, sometimes we get glimpses into it when we get calls asking for help and we dig deep enough to say, well, why are you you know, sort of even doing it that way to begin with, what, what's your end goal? We might be able to change the workflow and change behaviors, but really not until we do something like a resilience diagnostic do we really get a deeper perspective. And uh, that's the great thing about this. You, you take what we have from a, uh, a um, quantitative standpoint, and then you layer on that the qualitative view of how the technology is being used. And um, that seems to work really well for some great insights. It does, so, and yeah. it quickly. You know, and the, yeah. the thing about this too is it, it works very quickly. There's a lot of other, you know, tools and things that, that are on the market that are like mm -hmm. software tool you download and supposedly it's going to, you know, scan and watch how everybody behaves. Um, and I've seen yeah. the out output of some of those things. And in some cases, they're, they're, they have some insight, but the stuff that they provide insight on are things that, well, you could, you could just do on your own you know, without yeah. spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a software license. If you just spend a few, a little bit of time with folks, you know, over coffee, you know, a half a dozen mm -hmm. interviews or so um, to just get, it's not an audit. It's literally just asking people like, Hey, you know what, what's your pain points? You know, mm -hmm. what are, that are, are working really well for you, you know, and just have a conversation, not about security, not about resilience. It's really kind of like um, you can't talk about, I had a mentor who used to say, you, you, if you're trying to get to the heart of a matter, you can't mention the matter. You can't mention the, the issue. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of talk, talk around it and shape the mm -hmm. conversation so that people naturally go, you know, um, to talk about that. And so, you know, as technologists, we're not famous for being good at talking to people. And mm -hmm. so, right. somehow I, I'm more interested in people now than I am, you know, the tech because they're, they're much more challenging, first of all. And when we talk to people about technology, um, a lot of times, it, it's it's kind of a um, uh, almost a, a, a therapy session because we're all we're all sick of it. We're all you know there's all we all have things about technology that um, are that burden us, mm -hmm. right? And there's that emotional you know uh, that, that kind of behavioral economics of technology. And when we don't confront it directly, when we don't you know have those conversations with our our people that we work with, um, the outcome is very different. Than if we do, and and what we we found over the, the years is it's it's easily worth the investment of spending a few hours talking to people and the kinds of services and the quality of those services that we can deliver as a result. Yes. So if if you have not gone through a resilience diagnostic with us, you know, please reach out to us and start that conversation. Although most of what we've done have been for our small business clients. There have been some enterprise organizations with internal IT who have also wanted our perspective on the group that we're working with, and we can do a resilience diagnostic for that group as well. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. And, and Chad, you mentioned culture. Uh, I think what we find in, in nearly all the diagnostic, resilience diagnostic, is that the, the resilience culture needs to be either established or improved. And that's really what, what we're trying to do is start toward building a culture of resilience, uh, which means, you know, any, anyone who thinks that we can just 
give you some paperwork that you sign and check some boxes and say, yes, we, we now have a culture of resilience. Um, That'd be great. That'd be so awesome. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome. <laughs> but that, that is a, a very uh, sad uh, misunderstanding of what this is about. And you, you have to build that culture. And we've been working on building this culture internally within Forget Computers for many years. And I think we're very good at it, but we're constantly trying to improve on it and see, you know, where we need to improve or reduce our risk. And uh, it, it takes time and effort, but you have to start somewhere. And, and the resilience diagnostic is a great place to start. And then it goes deeper. And, and in fact, uh, before I get to sort of the bullet list of things that I think are kind of considered a minimum today of that defense in depth, is there anything more you want to talk about as far as culture goes, Chad? Because I know this really is the under. Oh, it's, it, it's really a big topic. I mean, I, I would I would just ramble and, and lose yeah, everyone. Okay. <laughs> it's so important. It really, you know, people um, people make mistakes, not machines, right? So yeah. as long as we're in, we're the ones, you know, computers are only as smart as those of us sitting in front of them. So um, these kinds of incidents, they're 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 easy mistakes to make. Mm-hmm really easy to make and we can't um i mean we have you know we the the royal we you know we have collectively shamed our audiences our users for making mistakes and clicking on links and you know there have been trainings that say don't click on links i think that's a terrible piece of advice right people Mm -hmm. their job is to click on links you can't Mm -hmm. tell them to click on links you know so this 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 cultural shift this is this mental model um, is as much of a shift for you know those of us in technology as well as the folks that we serve is to understand that you know we're human we are going to be get we are going to get busy and we're going to start clicking on stuff because we got to get stuff done we got lists and we got emails rolling in um, and so it's really important that these kinds of cultural you know shaping efforts um, are already aligned, right? If we're, if we're going in to try to teach, you know, f- uh, fish how to swim, we've got to make sure that we're, we're giving them, you know, some good water to swim, yeah. right? And if we're not doing that, we're wasting everybody's time and, and resources. And, and it's important to, to have alignment across those things. And that's often um, overlooked. Yeah. So uh, I've got one more slide and we'll review this and then wrap up. But, um, and this does not apply as we said to everyone, it's not, uh, you know, we don't want to bring uh, a, a tank to a knife fight. We don't want to overburden anyone with more than what they need. <laughs> We're already cognitively overloaded. You know, yeah, like, right. Dream. But, you know, over the, over the past several years, uh, a lot of new um, techniques and, and platforms have e- evolved to the point where this list in front of you is pretty much everything that I almost consider a minimum today yeah. in an organization. And yeah. to be honest with you, when I, when I look at this, and this is everything that we're doing and more, um, you know, all of this probably cost anywhere from five to $10 per employee per month. So when you add it all up, you're talking an additional anywhere from 50 to $100 per employee per month that you as an organization need to spend to better protect yourself. And I would say those that are not protecting themselves, uh, they're just playing, playing the uh, roulette or the, this is even, you know, and this, this is the average bike lock today. Yeah. Right. I mean, really, I mean, let's not mince words. This is, this is the bare minimum, right? You want, we want a criminal to kind of, think about walking past you and finding another, you know, easier target, you got to have at right. least this stuff, man. If you don't have this stuff, you're just, you just left your bike against the fence. I mean, there's no lock on it. I mean, it's that trivial and easy yeah. for to work so around. Uh, we could probably talk for a half hour on each of these bullet points, but I'm going to go through them rather quickly. Security awareness education. We typically start with, after the diagnostic, we start with a in-person training session that Chad or Chad and I deliver. And then we follow, follow that up with ongoing video training platform, uh, which typically has a yearly video, all your employees uh, watch and take a test on. Uh, and then weekly summary or supplemental videos. That's really nice. The reporting is nice on that, mm-hmm. you know, because it can, it's demonstrable, like concrete 
evidence of your, your effort and your commitment. And a lot of your clients, clients are going to be asking for that if they haven't already, they're mm-hmm. going to want some kind of, you know, something demonstrable that you're, you know, educating your folks. Yeah. And, and paired with that is a phishing campaign where you can basically, you know, send out some phishing campaigns to your own team. Uh, and if anyone clicks on it, you have an opportunity to have a conversation about what that means. So you're educating them with some face, uh, some safe fails uh, where they can learn what uh, a good and bad link is. And it sounds like a small thing, but it, it can be very helpful. And um, I know when we first started doing those, it was great to see that our team identified them um, as, as, you know, hey, Ben, this looks suspicious. And yes, you're right. It is suspicious as part of our phishing campaign. Um, it's all about building awareness and security awareness education is a foundation for building that. And it's not a one and done. Um, second on the list, two factor authentication or multi factor authentication. That's pretty much uh, a no brainer today. And although it should be a default for everyone, I think we've all noticed that there are platforms that have it never by default. They have it as an option. Unfortunately, sometimes that's a paid option. Like you have to get to a, a level to, to get that feature. But more and more, I've seen people, I think Microsoft was one of the first ones to say, we're not going to charge people for that. They made it part of the program. It's, it's, it just needs to be implemented. Mm-hmm. And that sounds you know trivial, but in a large organization can be confusing and people can get locked out if it's not done correctly. So um, you should be doing that for yourselves. And you should be enforcing that for your organization. It prevents but it has ninety-five plus, per, you know, percent of the kinds of incidents, the bad news that you don't want to get. Yeah, right? I mean, it just does. It's a it's a hassle, but the return on that investment is is it's really worthwhile to protect you, especially your family, your friends. Like, make sure everybody's using two FA. Right, and then uh, password manager. I, I I really don't know how anyone today can manage their passwords without a password manager. We use one password teams edition or business edition and um, anyone, any of them, you know, any password manager that you want to use, it's Dashlane, it's, you know, Bitwarden, it's LastPass. It doesn't really matter. You know, if you're using the ones built into the browsers, even that's better than nothing, but yeah, those those aren't portable. They're kind of a hassle, right? So, but if you're using the same password over and over, that's, that's not terrible. Not, not <laughs> terrible. And to even, you know, password manager isn't going to help you if you're doing, if you're doing that, if you're reusing no. your password, um, criminals use a tactic called credential stuffing. And what they do is they, they get it, they get their, their grubby mitts on a password that was stolen, you know, from somewhere and uh, that it's been verified as legit. And then they start hammering that. Maybe it's a, it's a financial account. Maybe it's a Wells Fargo account and they have an email address mm-hmm. and this password, right? So they go to every site, on the internet and they use automated tools to do that. Right. And they plug that password in there and everywhere they get a hit, they go and they harvest that account and they might not use it right away. They might just sit on it and wait. Right. So if you are reusing passwords, you Mm -hmm. can bet that it's only a matter of time because before you like lose an entire weekend to some breach or some, something that somebody got because you use the same password in multiple places. Do not do that. Don't do it. I mean, it's so, I can't even, you know, I hope that no one out there that ever watches this is like, oh, I should have listened to this first because we know what that's like when something happens. I mean, it is stressful and just use a password manager. Let it generate the passwords for you. Don't even, yeah. you won't even know them anymore. Um, I, I only know one passcode. I, actually, I barely know that with Face ID and unlocking with my Apple Watch. Uh, I know the, the one password to get into my one password manager my password manager and on the rare occasion where i have forgotten that password uh i go to a, a safe where i have it written down and nice. it's a bit of a pain but uh typically I, I i've only had to use that once and i can't remember what situation prompted it but typically between my iphone my ipad and my mac one of them will face id i can open the face id to get the password i need um, the, the one password to unlock. But anyway, I'm going down a rabbit hole of confusion. The point is you need a password manager and never reuse your passwords. I don't know any of my passwords except for that one. 
um, training platform. I think that's a duplicate of security awareness education. So those I need to combine those into one. Uh, advanced endpoint protection. This is, I'll, I'll just say, the modern iteration of antivirus. Um, and for a long time, the Apple world did not run antivirus, or even when we did, it was really just a port of a Windows app, and it was terrible because it slowed us down and, and looked ugly and nobody liked it. Um, but today, every time, every time we roll this out to a client, we find stuff. And they, people just didn't know it was running on their machine. Um, most of it's pretty, in, you know. Sadware, uh, most of it. Most of it's yeah. just stuff that seems innocuous, but it's not, right? It's, yeah. it's the, the level of deception has just, just keeps, you know, uh, evolving. Deception keeps expanding, you know, into new contexts. And so anytime we have malware on our machine, it's really bad. We need to get it off. Yeah. I mean, it, it's even the word, even if it's not uh, stealing data from you, which it's it poised to. is, <laughs> yeah. it's poised to, and it's just slowing down your machine mm -hmm. and it's making for a bad work experience. So we want to get rid of that and not see it come back. So advanced endpoint protection, uh, network management, uh, you know, that's, that's one that was, uh, it, it's network management is actively working to protect your network uh, infrastructure, yeah. infrastructure, which as we all know, most of us are working from home now. So our network infrastructure is back in the office and whatever and, we, or whatever we have at home now. Right. Yeah. So, right. It's whatever we have at home. Yeah. And that's not awesome because if we have not paid attention to it in a long time, for example, like our modem or routers or whatever. We haven't updated the firmware on our modem that it's could be security uh, risk. Possible. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so it's really, we have to start thinking about infrastructure as infrastructure, not home and office. We really have to think, kind of keep them in the same room in our minds. I mean, a lot of people at home, from what I understand, they don't even change the default admin password, mm -hmm. which not means anyone who can get anywhere near your network could probably hack into you. They're sitting in the street your, next to your yeah. wife and you know, yeah. hacking your modem and, and they, don't, they don't even know it until some massive botnet attack comes that they're targeting some big corporation. And then for that day, someone will be like, oh, our internet doesn't work. And they're calling Comcast or they're calling AT&T saying, how come I can't get out of the internet? AT&T has no insight either. They don't know that there's a botnet, you know, a DDoS attack being launched from their home modem, yeah. right? So everyone, everyone's clueless to this. It's not just you know our, our, our mm -hmm. everyday people that are working from home. It's pretty much the whole world that we have to yeah. help educate. And then this uh, this is a little more advanced, but cloud directory, um, cloud hosted directory, or SSO, which stands for single sign on. Um, this is the idea that you have one directory. Uh, used to be Active Directory was a very popular one, and still is on the Windows side. Uh, Macs are relatively new to this concept, but I would say if you have at least 10 people, 10 employees or more, you'll benefit from this. And if you have less than 10 employees, you can they actually get one, of the, yeah, yeah. You can get one of these accounts free through, uh, we, we use Jump Cloud. There's also Okta, there are a couple others. And, and this is uh, all like Cloud Directory and SSO, to be super clear, mm -hmm. uh, part of identity and access management, right? So in a lot of, um, like literature or things about this buzzwords on the internet. It's IAM stands for identity and access management. So I am is the, the thing that is really important because that controls who has access to what, right? And for how long and, you know, when they leave, do they still have access? No, we use, you know, directory services to re re withdraw, you know, that access. And so identity and access management is, Absolutely. And I don't think, Ben, you put these in here in any particular order of importance because, no. you know, these are all, it's kind of like on the car. Are you going to get rid of seatbelts or airbag right. or you're not going to you know, have any of this stuff? No, you have to have all of this stuff, right? It all um, works together. Yeah, It all works together. Right. Exactly right. And in fact, if you have a cloud directory, you know, in order to spin up security awareness education, you just connect it to your directory Everyone, everyone in the directory gets an invite. And if you remove someone from the directory, they get removed from your security awareness education platform. So this is all kind of works together to quickly onboard, securely onboard, 
terminate, securely terminate, uh, yeah. make things easier for the employees, make things easier for IT, make things yeah. more consolidated and secure. Yeah. So you're not wondering. If someone leaves a device on top of a pay station in a parking garage or their mm -hmm. device gets stolen, somebody breaks into their house and steals their computer, what are you going to do then? They got all kinds of, you know, proprietary information or discretionary information, client information on there. What are you going to do? Um, yeah. IAM services or SSO kinds of based services uh, enable, you know, teams like us to wipe those machines remotely the next time they connect to the internet. So you're at least minimizing uh, the risks to your reputation. You know, you got certainly other issues in a theft, a physical theft of a device like that. Um, but we would be powerless without these kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. So the last two advanced email protection, you know, and this is one we get a lot of questions on because once again, a lot of our clients, not all, but a lot of them do get email services from us. And when we say we want to spend some time and resources and money invested in, you know, advanced email protection, they're like, well, aren't you already doing that for us? And the truth right. is we're simply passing on the service that Microsoft or Google is providing. Uh, and that's a license to hosted email. And yes, we're helping you spin up that account and we're helping you manage maybe your calendars and your groups and we're helping you uh, delete those accounts when they need to be deleted. But advanced email protection is a whole nother level of intention and scrutiny that you have to build over time to protect your domain from bad email, but also allow your domain to function with proper email, meaning a mailing list uh, or a newsletter or something that, that is yours. So this is not something that we can just turn on or off. We have to work with you and our team to build it over time. And, and the, the payout is you get much, um, get fewer uh, phishing attempts through email. We can't eliminate it, but you get fewer. And uh, you also get a better delivery rate, right? Because now those modern companies that are using the same advanced email protection that we're implementing for you, they trust you at a higher level when you're delivering email to them. So uh, if we were all doing this, it would be fantastic, but uh, not everyone does. So Chad, anything to add to that? No, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suite of technologies uh, that work together that require a lot of, time and intention to refine that. And it's really protecting your brand in the end too. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. here that prevent you from ever getting blacklisted. Uh, if there's anyone that's ever been blacklisted, it's a, it's a very, um, you know, ubiquitous, you know, but, but ambiguous process to try mm -hmm. to fix it. Uh, a lot of times it, it really, it, I've seen email systems, complete domains be offline for months at a time. Um, and it's preventable. Yeah. And the last one, VPN. We all know the term VPN. In fact, we may have had or used a VPN at one time. And VPN traditionally was used to get back into the office. And we have some clients right now in a, in a rush to work from home are using a VPN to get back into the office to get to files on a server in the office. But the modern day implementation of a VPN or a virtual private network is literally to protect you no matter where you are on, on any network. It, it, and Chad, your analogy is, you know, when we're on the internet, and correct me if I get this wrong, when we're on the internet, typically we're sending postcards back and forth. We're interacting with messaging through postcards. A VPN puts an envelope around that postcard to protect it from prying eyes and gives us that extra layer of protection, that extra defense in depth that we need when we're traveling on who knows what network or even in some cases working from home on a network that we may not know is completely secure or not because we yeah. haven't, you know, put network management on there. Yeah. There's so, more, there, there are more people, you know, working from home now uh, in the Western world than, than ever before. And part of the, part of the, benefit of working from home is certainly there's there's comfort and you know there's probably more distractions in some ways that's not a pro but a con but in in some ways um it's a great opportunity for us to build some long term value into those home networks that haven't existed before that gives us directly as individuals better privacy and better security right um and vpn's a great 
way to do that. And there's a lot of things that are being transmitted out of our devices, right? It's not just web traffic. There's, you know, there are quest, you know, questions from the computer to a, a time server that says, hey, what time is it? You know, and, and DNS and hey, what, what, what uh, website is 4.2.2.2, right? So there's lots of different kinds of things going out from our computers. And if we can wrap all that stuff in a nice envelope to, again, increase the cost, for a criminal that would otherwise, you know, find that yeah. easy to exploit and, 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 and you know, ruin our week. Um, why wouldn't we use that? We would definitely, you know, want to use that, especially now that we're at home and we have potentially kids and other people that, that we care about using those things. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big discussion, but in a nutshell, you know, these things that, that Ben's laid out here are, are really the bare minimum, you know, in so many ways. Yeah, as you so, said, this is the bike lock that everyone needs. Uh, the bike locks and uh, Chad, you mentioned earlier, we don't need to bring a tank to a knife fight. I'm actually, this is the end of the presentation, but this is a leftover from nice. the presentation I started on uh, or started yeah. with to kind of adapt this. And yeah. uh, Chad and I are big proponents of let's not overbuild this. Let's no. only what you need in there. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if we just blindly apply everything we know, from a security and resilience aspect to your environment, you know, no one's going to like that. No one's going to enjoy it. No one's going to, no one's going to do it. They're not going to do, no do it. They're not going to feel good doing it. And that's why the security awareness training is really foundational because, you know, we've seen it so many times where we say you need two factor, you need multi-factor. Let's roll it out. We roll it out. Nobody likes it because it's a pain in the butt. It's an extra step you have to take. It's an extra lock you have to, unlock and it's because they don't understand why they're doing it as soon as they understand the importance of why they're doing it they're they're asking us for it they're saying i don't care i don't care how much it it cost or what a pain it is i want that in my organization and i want it enforced and that's really where everyone needs to be to to appreciate the these options that we that's have peace of mind really i mean it, it's it's sleeping at night um, there's so many things that are uncertain right now. Um, there's a lot of dis disruptions and, and, and it's important that all these things are being disrupted for sure, because we need to change. Um, but it's a good time to change. And one of the things that I've, I've kind of globbed onto during, you know, since pandemic started and certainly now with everything else that is, has joined the party of 2020, um, is I really take comfort in the things that I can control, you know, mm -hmm. and, turning something on like MFA or using a password manager, that's one step. That's one little thing we can do for ourselves that, that is like, Hey, I did this one thing for myself that, that mm -hmm. gives me mind. And so it starts there and it really is until we start tinkering with this stuff and, and feeling the kinds of emotional support it can give us um, that, that those things go, I think vastly understated. Um, we, we could use all the help we can get right now to feel empowered and yeah. that we have, yeah. you know, we have some things we can do to take back control of our privacy and, you know, certainly our security. Okay. Well, I think that wraps it up. Uh, we went, we went way beyond 30 minutes, but we kept it under an hour and, uh, we could go on and on all day about this stuff. That was a, a high level oversimplification of what this is. But if you have any questions about it, please reach out to us. If, if you're not doing any of this, definitely reach out to us. It's okay if you're not doing any of this. And there are no silly questions, so don't right. be afraid to ask even the silliest ones. Right. I mean, we know we know there are people not doing this. And, and our job is really to build, uh, um, not, well, build a case, but also just to get the word out. Like, the word is, I want to make sure I've done everything I can to make people aware that this is what they need to be doing. And, and it's, and it's changing. It's, it's improving, you know, password managers have improved endpoint protection has improved. You know, a lot of this stuff came on a few years ago and we were, we we're like, no, it's not ready yet. It's not ready. It's not good enough. And, but now we're at a point where everything I listed there, as Chad said, is kind of the basics and that you can do more and maybe in certain situations, if your risk is big enough, you, you will need to do more. But I can't think of anyone who really should be doing less than what we what we talked about today. So no, not if they okay. don't want to deal with this stuff, you know. I mean, it's it's kind of like take your risk. That's cool. You can roll the dice too, right? 
Yeah. I mean, looking back at all the money we've invested ourselves in securing our team, our clients, our employees, um, our organization, you know, looking back on it, it's like, wow, that is a lot, but it also allows me to sleep better at night because if I didn't know what I know today and you said to me, you should be doing all of this, it, it would be overwhelming. It yeah. would be frightening. Uh, it would be sound expensive. Um, but when you think about the, the risk of losing an entire business, putting people out of work, losing clients, maybe jeopardizing those clients, um, it's There's really a lot more at stake now than there has ever a been. Lot, a lot more. So it's really not a lot to ask to put some effort into this. And, the, and it gets easier over time, right? As you build that culture, yeah. get those tools in place. You know, and it's, it's small steps. Easy. You don't do this all at once. Uh, and, and, and no one does this alone. You know, we do this yeah. as a, we all, you know, Ben's sick of hearing me, you know, maybe Michelle too is sick of hearing me say that we all share the same fate and we do, you know, when we click on something that we shouldn't, or we, you know, fall for a social engineering um, attack, um, we don't just impact our day, right? It impacts a lot of people's day. Um, and this, these are tools that can vastly minimize those kinds of preventable risks. Right. And so it makes them worthwhile. Okay. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Those that joined.